Well, glory to God. Welcome once again to Power of Faith. I'm Pastor Philip Durbin with your family of Faith Victor Church right here in the capital city of Frankfort, Kentucky. And just delighted to be able to share with you in the truths of God's word once again. Luke 1, 37 says, With God, nothing shall be impossible. And I want to welcome you to, yes, another special edition of Power of Faith. It's testimony session time. And I have in the studio a very special person to me. She's dear to my heart. And I've been in love with her for years. My wife, Alberta Derber. Alberta. Hallelujah. My love of my life. Oh, my. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Welcome. I, I am. I've been looking forward to, to uh, this interview, uh, Alberta, because uh, I know where... God has brought you from, and I knew you when you were a heathen, and we were heathen together. And uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna bust the devil in his mouth. Yes, we are. And uh, you know when we give our testimony, it prophetically touches people's lives, mm -hmm. and you know people can look at us and say. Wow, they got it made in the shade. You know, they've never had any uh, difficulties. And, you know, there's a problem within the church that uh, people aren't giving their testimonies. And uh, matter of fact, they're, they're kind of told not to give that because, you know, it looks bad. You know, you might be a uh, have some position in a church and no, don't, don't share that testimony. I mean then how would people look at you holding that position? Well, that, that old man's dead. And and all things have become new, right? So we're gonna we're gonna back you all the way up to, up. to <laughs> many decades, right? To uh how you was raised. But before I get into that, let me say something. You were saying how they they don't want you to give their testimony. You know, and it was reminded when I first came up. Yeah, here. we'll get on okay. to that later. All right. Now, I want. I want to go. <clears throat> how that, I was raised. How you was raised. What kind of family you was born in? Brothers, sisters, where? Well, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, into a Italian Catholic family. I had two brothers and a sister. I was the baby of four. And um, what else? What, what was school like? School? I went to 12 years of Catholic school, grade so, school and high school. So nuns. I had nuns back then. I don't even think any exist anymore. I'm not sure. So you, you, you were raised in uh, Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, the baby before. Your mom and dad, what were they like? Very precious people. They were just what you would call good people, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they were Catholic. My dad didn't really go to church all that much. We always were in church. And uh, later in years, well, I say later, but he was, I don't know, he may have been 50 or so. So as a family, you went, you went to church? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that would be mass. Yes. Once a week. Yeah. Something well, like that. yeah, Sundays. And then when they had like special things. special services, yeah. And so what was growing up in in Catholic school like? <sighs> you had uniforms and I, all that. Yeah, yeah. We wore uniforms. I really enjoyed school. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever learned anything really because I was always that cute little girl mm -hmm. that they would just, everybody liked me because I was this cute little girl. I was very little and very cute and very sweet. And, and then so, just passed you on. Yeah, I mean, everybody liked me, so no matter, that was grade school. Now, you were telling me uh, that when you'd get out of school, you'd go around the corner to... Well, that's high school. High See, school. That was from... Uh, See, Catholic school, grade school, went from grades one 
first grade to eighth grade. Mm. And then you graduated and you went to high school. And my high school was West Catholic Girls High School, all girls. And it's right near the bandstand. It was right around the corner from band, American Bandstand. Dick Clark's American Bandstand. Dick Clark, Bob <laughs> Horn, the two of them then way back. Okay. And um, we were told we weren't allowed to go. But I don't know what year it was that I started going. I think he had to be a certain age back then. And one of your best friends was one of the main dancers. Yes, yes. Right? Carol Skaldaferi, she was like a star. Till mm -hmm. today, I mean, she's in heaven right now. You can go on YouTube and, and, yes, and see the interviews with her and so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, any boys in your life through all this time? Yeah, from the time I was 13 years old, I fell in love with a boy, uh, Jimmy, and we were boyfriend and girlfriend till 21. We were going to get married. But he broke up. He, well, we broke up, you know, off and on in those years. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I had a drinking problem because around. How did you start drinking? I don't know. Everybody just started drinking. I would, you know. It was just part of life? In a way, my, nobody in my family drank. Now, you had a grandfather that drank. Oh, you? my grandfather. Well, yeah, that's right. My grandfather used to make wine. He was an alcoholic, beautiful man, beautiful, always in church, did lots of things for the church, built chapels, did things for Catholic orphanages, a wonderful man. But he'd man. give you a little wine every now and then. Well, he mostly didn't give me, when I was a little girl, I used to go down to his wine cellar and open it, open the thing and drink it. it was, mm -hmm. But nobody ever knew that, I don't think. I don't know why I re even so, remember that. But he... he the yeah. drinking problem is... How he get drunk immediately. Yeah, yeah. Now, how old was you when, when that was going on? Well, that's... I don't... I really don't remember In your a teens. lot. Yeah, In my late teens. teens. Now, late teens, not early Now, teens. You, you told me as a little girl that... You would sit in front of the television and watch Catherine Kuhlman. I could still see me doing that. Uh, Catherine Kuhlman's ministry was out of Philadelphia, if I recall right. I guess, yeah. With the I TV don't. program and everything. I don't. Actually, the Lord showed me that. Now, hmm. I remember her so much. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But my parents, they didn't know anything about, you know, like... Um, evangelist mm -hmm. or they didn't know any of that stuff. We didn't have that in the Catholic church back then. And I, the Lord showed me that as a little girl, I would take one of the, I saw myself taking one of the dining room chairs for some reason. And I'd put it right by the dining room, you know, mm -hmm. the living room that had that archway. Right. And I would sit there and I see me watching TV and Catherine Kuhlman, and I just was fascinated with her. She was not an attractive woman at all, but she was really dramatic. Yeah. And I think that must be what I liked first, but I was drawn to what she was doing. By the Spirit, yeah. Yeah, the healing mm -hmm. and how she called on the Holy Spirit. That was happening to me uh, with Oral Roberts. My mom had me, uh, he had a he had a TV program mm -hmm. that came on Sundays where, in, in, where we lived in Kentucky. And it came on right when everyone was getting ready to go to church. And so she would have me get ready first. And then she wanted me to record on our little tape deck so she could listen to all oh, Robert's Roberts. Lake. That's why. So I'm sitting in front of the TV. Everyone, everyone else in the family is doing their thing. And I'm listening to all Roberts talk about something good is yeah, going to happen to you today. I used to, to listen today. to him, too. I don't know why I would hear him. Yeah. Because my family, unless they did and I didn't, mm. I wasn't aware of it. Right. But, but to, God God was working in your life way back then, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, when I was a very little girl, I remember in, I think it was first grade, we re, we had what they said we received our first Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. And we, the little girls got dressed up like brides. We had little white dresses or long dresses, mm -hmm. and we had veils, just like a bride. And I thought 
I was marrying Jesus. That's mm. what I thought back then. I mean, I as a little girl, I was very, very much in love so, with Jesus. So uh, you, you're going to get married at 21, but you didn't. What happened? Jimmy broke up with me, and I was I went wild after that. I got into drugs and started out smoking marijuana and then got into quaaludes, acid. I started the tripping. The whole rock and roll. Totally. I went from a young woman that was very sophisticated. Uh, me and my friends, we were sophisticated. We dressed, you know, like... Uh, like Jack A. Kennedy and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And very, very elegant. We thought we were elegant. Uh, going to very sophisticated nightclubs mm -hmm. and discos. We'd go to New York and party on weekends. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I turned around and started wearing jeans that had big lips and a tongue embroidered mm -hmm. on my butt and, you know, putting butterflies, tripping. And it was crazy. Crazy. So uh, that broken heart, that broken relationship, puts you in a tailspin. Totally. And now, totally. And uh, up having sex, and so you you weren't other... you weren't you weren't sexu sexually active no, prior to twenty one uh, from thirteen to twenty one, Jimmy. No. So you was a virgin all the way up to twenty one. Uh, probably twenty two, twenty three. Okay, so now you're into drugs. What are you doing for finances? Oh, I was a beautician. Okay. Yeah, I I managed to work my best. We all, everybody was getting mm -hmm. stoned, and you know, all my friend, new friends, and. Uh, are you living in uh, with your mom and no, dad? No, no, no. I I moved out of there. Oh, I don't know. After after Jimmy broke up with me, mm -hmm. uh, I was I moved out, and now I. But I, but I lived right near my parents. Mm -hmm. But I didn't go home much because I was so into drugs, you mm -hmm. know. And I tried. If I would, then I moved out to California. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So how, how old was you when you moved to California? Uh, my late 30s. Late 30s? Wait, 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 wait. I moved out there 70, so I was... Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> 73, we just, we just... I would have been 40, right? <laughs> no, I would have been 30. Wait a minute. Uh, I was born in 43. In your, in your early 30s? Yeah. So why did you leave Pennsylvania to go to California? Well, I always wanted to. I was going to move to Florida because I I just wanted to move and I didn't I hated well, what the brought weather. you to California? Uh, my girlfriend Irene that we grew up together. Uh, I was going to move to Florida and she got a job offer in California with the man that she was working with in Philly. He moved out to California and he offered her a job. So she said, "If you'll go with me, I'll go." So we went out together. Whereabouts in California? Right where it's all happening in Hollywood at first, <laughs> and then Studio City, and then I moved to Venice, California, where every every crazy thing you could imagine was right there. Right there. Yeah. And you just jumped and right I in the middle of it. jumped right in the middle of it. Well, what about, what about men? What do you mean, what about men? Did you just, after Jimmy, just say, forget men? Oh, no. There were quite a few men in my life that, you know, I was very promiscuous for drugs, you know, mm -hmm. and, but, but I wasn't a crazy drug addict, you know, I was functioning. Yeah, I understand. You know, I mean. You wouldn't, you wouldn't lay down on, on no, a street corner somewhere. No, and then when I moved to California, that's when I started getting really, um, when I, it started really. Loose. Well, loose isn't really the word. That's when. I was really starting to get to be a drug addict, bad, yeah. you know. So, are in but I fell having in relationships that. with men, did you ever get pregnant? I did in Philadelphia. You did in Philadelphia? Yeah, I did in Philadelphia. Three times. In Philadelphia? Oh, yeah. 
before you went to California. Oh, yeah. Okay, so what did you do with your pregnancies? I aborted them, mm. which was horrendous for me. I never thought I'd ever have sex with a man before marriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I was raised. Mm -hmm. And that's how I thought. It's mm -hmm. not that my parents said that or the church said mm -hmm. it. That's what I believed. You right. know, I was I was a, quote, good girl. Mm -hmm. I was. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to be, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, but when you're into drugs and everything crazy, when you just when you get into drugs, drinking alcohol also, I mean, I, I can't say, you know, alcohol is OK. So you got, not, you're, you're, you're pregnant. Three times. Backstreet abortions. Well, they weren't legal. They didn't have no abortion clinics. No, they didn't have big posters. Pregnant, need help, call us. Billboards. Billboards. Yeah. What I say? Posters. <laughs> Billboards, yeah. So. And you what, couldn't find it in the yellow What pages. did those abortions, how did they affect you? Oh, they're horrendous. Not, you know, uh, first you have to find an abortionist and like I said you don't go on the yellow pages you know mm -hmm. and I don't even know I had a friend that knew somebody mm -hmm. and that's how you go and the and the women were very very nice to you they they're not you know mm -hmm. uh one doctor was goofy but uh that first woman told me she said I will see you again and I said never even though she was very nice mm -hmm. she said I will see you again well, I didn't go back to her. <laughs> it's like, uh, but when you have one, you're gonna have more than one. Until you will have more than one. I'm sorry. That's in that, if you're in that lifestyle of alcohol craziness, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, and drugs. And but, if you, I mean, I had to come up with the money all the time. Yeah. So you're. That's really crazy. You're in California with your girlfriend in Hollywood. In, in you you go from having three backstreet abortions uh, to uh, living in Hollywood slash Venice, and uh, you're living you know the uh, the crazy hippie uh, a lot of uh, Jesus you know in the '60s the Jesus movement and all that was rolling and and uh, people were coming out with burn your bras and free love and yeah i did that and, and oh, you did that and i and i didn't burn them but i went yeah. without it and i should have never and and so you're you're in that scene where where's you know where's the little girl that was sitting in front of the television watching Catherine coleman where where's god are are you praying from time to time are you calling out to to him all the time all the time because I had a lot, so especially when the drugs got really bad in my life, mm -hmm. uh, I went through a lot of really bad stuff when I lived in. I had a boyfriend that was constantly throwing me out because, because of, of the, the drugs. drugs. Yeah, I had. Uh, I was so, raped. So throwing out, so uh, that means I, you were living together. Uh, yeah. And did you say you were raped? I was raped when I was in California, and I heard God. I. I can't say I heard him audibly, mm -hmm. but it was as clear as could possibly be. In the midst of being raped, he said, just keep quiet and stay still and you'll be all right. And that's exactly what happened. Wow. Yeah, that was pretty uh, intense because this, this guy, there was, I don't know if it was that guy, but there was a rapist going around and he would chip at the women's bodies with a razor blade as he's as he's raping them that didn't happen to me mm. like i said i don't know if it was that man but when i heard god i mean i because i could still see it mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. you know i don't go back there like tripped me out even going through this testimony right now mm -hmm. so uh you 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 you're calling out to god but you're a full-blown alky drug drug addict you right? know you know there's times when I remember one night in uh, in my apartment, one of my apartments, I uh, must have fallen asleep and had the little television on that I had. And uh, phew. excuse me. 
it's me. I mean, I'm not. It's just coming back when you think of how good God is. Mm-hmm. One night, I mean, this was nothing. It was one of the times that my boyfriend had thrown me out, and I was in my own apartment. I was still cutting. I was still a beautician. I managed to work all these years. And I, I was, I had, must have fallen us or nodded out, like we all know what nodded out mm. means. And I woke up because I was burning my leg with my cigarette. Mm-hmm. And when I woke up, the 700 Club was on. Mm-hmm. Pat Robertson. This is years back. Mm-hmm. And I remember listening to him. And my heart always went out. Mm-hmm. And I always probably said whatever prayer, you know, but never did anything mm-hmm. about it. Never called anybody or mm-hmm. like they tell you to call in. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that was just... I would always cry out to God, and God was always drawing on me, always drawing on yeah, me. Yeah, when you you can look back and see yes, those times. Yes, yes. You know, uh, Alberta, uh, you ended up uh, going to the Marshall Islands, and, yeah, and that's, but there there was something happened to your girlfriend. You told me before I went to the Marshall yeah. Islands. Yeah, in in the in the last few moments here, uh, I had a, a girlfriend that would take care of me, a beautiful, beautiful uh, a Latin. I forget where she was from right now, but uh, she she was a bartender and she managed an Italian restaurant. And she would always bring me food home and all because I was really a mess. I was, you know, I was a mess. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> then one, one day this guy shows up at my apartment and he's talking about Flora and and all kinds of crazy things. And he's sitting across from me and his finger was bleeding. And I asked him what happened. He said he had to go bring Flora's car back or something like that. I don't remember. And he was he said, I'll be back to talk to you. I don't I don't know if I knew. I don't remember if I even knew him. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? And but it was strange. I asked him what happened to his finger. I, he, I don't even know what he said, but. I find out in between that that Flora was murdered. I don't know how I even, I don't remember. I mean, this stuff is. And, you know, this is one of your best friends. My best friend. Is murdered, and probably the killer is right that there. That was him. Was, yeah. Okay, it was him, is in your apartment. And he's coming back. And that freaked you out big time. Well, when I found out, See, I, right now I'm trembling just from, I guess, the glory of God, I guess, just helping me. But I never experienced fear like I did then. Mm-hmm. I mean, my body was, it was like somebody had a vibrator inside my body continually. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to go back home to mm-hmm. my mother, but I couldn't until they found this guy. Then He never mm-hmm. came back. Well, we only got a, a, a few minutes left here, huh? So... Uh, you, you, they finally let you go, and uh, your brother. He lived in Kwajalein. Worked for in the years. Marshall Islands on Kwajalein for years. And you you wanted to just get an escape, right? I applied for it when I lived in California, but I, they got somebody else. The chances. Oh, okay, so you already tried to get on there. Yes. Yeah, so then when I went to Philadelphia, my brother called me and told me that it was open again. Okay. It was real short. Didn't work out. So I applied again. And that's when I was hired from Philadelphia. So it was better yet. I had Well I went out there. You got you got to the Marshall Islands and Kwajalein, and that's where uh we we meet. We'll get in that tomorrow. But Alberta, we we only got a little time here. There's people watching right now that are hurting, that have been through abortions, been raped, been their life threat, and so on and so forth. Just just take a few moments right there in that camera and minister to them. Okay. I was thinking about this this morning. There's so many people out there hurting. You're all out there hurting, Christians, whatever. But so many, many young people and older people don't even know sin because they don't know God. And right now, I know you're hurting. If you've been through abortion, if you're a drug addict, there's an answer. Jesus is the answer. You just cry out to him and say, Jesus, if what Alberta is saying is true, that you care for me and love me so much, 
come into my heart and show me that you're real. And in Jesus' name, he'll answer you. Wonderful, yes. wonderful, wonderful. Now, down at the bottom of the screen is our helpline, our prayer line. It's there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And listen, listen, what God has done in Alberta's life, mm -hmm. he's no respecter of persons. He'll do it in your life. Those prayer ministers are standing by to pray with you and for you. <clears throat> you don't have to live in depression. You don't have to live in shame and regret and, and addiction the rest of your life. Jesus is the answer. Yes, he is. And uh, tomorrow, you don't want to miss tomorrow's program and see how God really invades Alberta's life. Uh -huh. We'll see you tomorrow. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4 says, where the word of a king is, there, there is power. power. Be a blessing. The Power of Faith programs are available on YouTube 24-7, so you can watch from anywhere at any time. Search for Power of Faith on YouTube or go to youtube.com forward slash power of faith. Subscribe and click the bell to make sure you're notified whenever new episodes are posted. If you missed the episode or you just want to go back and watch it over and over again, the Power of Faith YouTube channel is there for you.